Okay, assalamualaikum everybody. Welcome back. Just checking we have all our panelists here. Okay, great. Do we have? Yeah, we've got that. Okay, great. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you've had um, a nice break, some time to stretch your legs. Um, welcome back to our second panel now. Um, so we had a panel uh, in the last hour where we discussed um, decisions in terms of whether a PhD is the right thing for you, um, how to decide uh, what subject to do, when to do it in the right time. Uh, and now we'll discuss a little bit more about uh, the actions um, such as sort of contacting supervisors, making good impression, um, getting the application right, uh, and then steps further after the PhD as well. So we're joined by three um, excellent panelists here today. So we've got um, Dr. Sama Lazami, who uh, is a departmental lecturer in contemporary Islamic studies at the University of Oxford. He completed his BA in Arabic and Islamic studies at Oxford and his MA and PhD in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. And his research focuses on Islam and modernity, particularly Islamic political thought. Uh, we also have Dr. Muhammad Meki, who is the Sultan Hassan al Bolkiah Fellow in Islamic Finance at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, and is also a departmental lecturer at the Department of International Development. Um, he holds degrees from LSC and Cambridge in Finance and Economics, and he completed his DPhil in, at Oxford in economics as well. Um, his research focuses on microfinance and small firms in developing countries. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Muhammad Al Ghabi, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher in neuroscience at the University of Oxford, and is also the co-lead of um, the Muslim Researchers Network. Um, he completed his undergrad at Oxford and his master's at UCL before completing his PhD at Cambridge in neuroscience. His research is on neural mechanisms of cognition with a focus on abstraction. Um, great, so let's jump right in then and get started. Um, so the first thing that kind of um, sort of naturally follows from where we left off in the last panel is um, now that we've decided we want to do a PhD and um, we've maybe thought about which field we want to do it in and it's the right time for us. Um, in terms of the application process, how do we stand out in interviews? Um, what sorts of um, tips can you give in terms of the interview, the written application process? Um, and I know that you know some of you are also involved in terms of um, selecting PhD students now or, or students to take on as researchers under you. Um, so is there any advice you can give both from your own personal experience doing a PhD, but also now being on the other end of it? and having researchers under you. So if we start with maybe um, Dr. Sam. Well, so that's, uh, Salaam Alaikum and, and thank you, Hannah, for um, hosting the session. Thank you for the ISOC to uh, arrange it. Um, I've jumped in a little late, so to speak, um, in the entire process. So uh, forgive me if I'm sort of um, not entirely uh, sort of systematic in the way in which I, I present my responses. So the three of us, uh, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Meki and myself, um, are in three very different fields. So we'll, I'm, I'm in the humanities, um, Mohammed Meki is in the social sciences, and uh, Mohammed is in the sciences, hard sciences, so to speak. So I, I can only speak for myself, and I think um, you know everyone will hopefully um, sort of put in comments uh, which are in accord with their own fields. In my case, um, I mentioned off the bat, generally we don't have interviews. Um, I did my PhD in the US and there we did actually have an interview. So they flew us out from, they flew me out from the UK and um, they put us through a process of interviews which lasted a full day, um, kind of a day and a half. But that's very unusual, I think. And, and um, I don't know about the other fields here, but they'll comment on that. Here, it's mainly about the application itself. And I think uh, at the end of the day in the humanities, it's a question of how clear is your proposal? How viable is the project that you're working on? Because at the end of the day, you are bringing 
um, a proposal to, uh, you know, your application is a proposal for a project which will preoccupate you for three to four years and you'll write 80,000 to 100,000 words about it. So how clear is that project that you have and how um, sort of strong are your credentials that signal that you can actually carry this through to its conclusion? So I'd say that like in, in very brief terms, um, that would be uh, some of the key uh, concerns. And I can elaborate further um, as the questions come through, as it were. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and you touched on something that we'll talk about a bit later as well in terms of doing a PhD in the US and how that differs. But um, so Dr. Muhammad, would you like to add anything on that front? Okay, Bismillah, thanks uh, to the ISOC for organizing this talk. Um, so I, yeah, I'd reiterate what Osama said, which is that um, you know we're coming from different fields, so everyone should take our own personal experiences because they're unique, and uh, also just try and think about what the norms are within a particular field. And my field, social science, there's no norm around an interview either. Um, it's uh, your application, but the reference letters are also very important. Um, the reference letters are some of the most important things as well, actually. So these days uh, in economics, the trend has become to do like an RA job or a pre-doctoral fellowship before even applying for a PhD. I mean, it, it's become a bit silly now in terms of people doing like three or four year pre-docs before applying for like a top PhD program in the US. Um, at some point, people are going to have to push back on that because it's not really reasonable, I think. But it's become very competitive and it's all about who you get your letter from, right? So. You know, can I get, can I do an RA job for you know Raj Chetty at Harvard or Esther Duflo at MIT or something? Because then they're going to write me a, a letter for uh, for uh, my PhD application. So the letter is important, but then you know, as Osama said, it's the basics of of the of the proposal. Really, um, it does it does it seem like a reasonable proposal? Um, is it like self-contained and does it show that you're kind of aware of the literature, the um, the protocols? The reality is that. Um, and I'm not sure how it is in other fields, but most of us are aware that when you start a PhD, you come in with a particular proposal and it inevitably changes a lot um, during the process of your research. And everyone knows this, right? And so it, it's like, uh, it's, it's a, we're aware of this, but at the same time, you have to have like a self-contained proposal when you're applying, even if things will change completely, you have to come in with something that, that seems, uh, seem, seems reasonable from start to finish. Um, in terms of methodology, uh, contribution to the literature, uh, etc. Um, and yeah, as, as, as I said, uh, the interview is important. Uh, well, we don't have an interview. The, the proposal is important and, and the references are, are quite important. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Um, let's move to Dr. Mohammadi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who has uh, been involved in organizing this. Uh, and for the uh, panelists, it's been uh, uh, great so far. Um, so yeah, uh, I agree with the previous two panelists that um, the process is somewhat heterogeneous across fields, but even within fields. Um, for the hard sciences, interviews are uh, usually done uh, for PhD. So you will apply and, and uh, 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 some people will be shortlisted and, and, and there will be an interview. So the interview is important. And I think in terms of the question of how to stand out, for me, um, the main thing is demonstrating potential for independence. Um, what we're looking for in a PhD student is not just someone who's gonna take instructions, uh, but rather someone who is already beginning to come up with their own ideas. Um, they don't need to have a fully formed project in mind, although you know some PhD applications will require you to, to, to write a project, but you will get help in that. Uh, others might be, even, even a PhD that uh, that already has a project uh, sort of pre-fabricated um, will want to look for people who are going to drive this project um, and really be proactive. So this has to be reflected in your application and also in the interview. Um, uh, so I think that's the sort of broad overview of what uh, of what we're looking for. Um, but I'm happy to expand on that as as the other questions come. Can I uh, just add something, uh, uh, Hannah? So, I mean, I kind of have an unfair advantage because I was the first asked, and as you guys are saying stuff, I'm also reflecting on what you're commenting on. So please feel free to sort of um, do ta'qib as well, to use an Arabic phrase. Um, okay, so 
uh, one of the things which is quite important in uh, an important distinction between the UK and the US, in the US, when you apply for a PhD, you won't get accepted unless they have funding for you. So every post, uh, every position for a PhD is a full, fully funded thing. Um, whereas in the UK, uh, you can actually fund yourself. And in the humanities generally, um, as a consequence, the in a sense, the bar for entry in the UK, even at a top university, is lower than that you have, what you have in the US. But, you know, unless you're from independent means and you're or a wealthy background or something, it's really not feasible to sort of um, uh, fund yourself. Uh, so most people will not pursue that. And I just want to highlight this distinction that, um, in a sense, it's easier to get into a university in the UK, even a place like Oxford, but it's um, it's far more difficult, I think. Not Maybe not far more difficult, but it's more difficult, certainly, than the US to get funding for a post. And that's something to bear in mind. And I just wanted to reiterate Mohammed, uh, Mohammadi's point about independence. In the humanities, you're not working within a sort of lab or a team under a scientist. Um, you are basically bringing your own project. And the amount of uh, feedback you get from supervisors is absolutely minimal, generally. Sometimes people will not see their supervisors um, you know, they'll see their supervisors for an hour each month or something like that. I think that's actually potentially the only obligation you have in a place like Oxford. So it's, it is really your project in a place like Oxford. And in the US system, usually a PhD has a built-in master's program, which is a taught program. And so there is, a, in a sense, more um, uh, systematic professional development that takes place in the US system. Um, but maybe I'm sort of, um, uh, because I didn't do my PhD in the UK system, uh, maybe I'm I'm not fully aware of some of the things in the humanities that are available. Can I um, take Osama's invitation to to add something? Um, it's it's very similar um, with the with the economics. Actually, um, in the US, it's a much longer PhD. You're expected to do a PhD for about six years, and it's like a two years master's program built in, and they're pretty much all fully funded. I think no one would ever enter a program without funding. I mean, in the UK. I, similar to the humanities, um, they tend to be like three-year PhDs, four-year, although they do drag on a bit more these days. Um, and people would start it with partial funding, do a bit of teaching on the side, but that's completely unheard of in the US. So the, this US-UK uh, distinction is uh, definitely the case um, in economics. And economics in the UK, generally, you, I mean, in Oxford, you'd, you'd, you'd already have identified a supervisor, you'd all be able to be in touch with the supervisor, and then you'd kind of naturally gravitate to their group. I mean, I was seeing my supervisor like a few times every week while it was quite an intense relationship. Um, but yeah, obviously in the US, if you're applying for a six-year program, you wouldn't need to have a supervisor identified beforehand because you'd do the structured kind of master's program for two years. Right, right. Okay, that's, the, that's great to touch on. That actually brings me nicely into the next question, which was this distinction between um, applying for a PhD in the US because some of our some of people, members in our audience are interested in doing a PhD there as well. Um, and so you've, you've all sort of touched on some of the differences there, but if I could go back to, to Dr. Osama, if you, could, um, if you could sort of talk about any differences, any key differences you know in terms of the application process in the US and how that differs um, with UK, you've talked about funding, but any other aspects? The application process, I mean, um... So before I go into the application process, I'll briefly say anyone who's interested in doing a humanities PhD in the US get a book um, by Gregory Semenza called Graduate Studies in the 21st Century. Um, fantastic book, which really kind of outlines what you need to do once you're in the PhD program. But in terms of the actual application process, um, and I'm, you know, my memory of this is a bit sort of faded now because it's over a decade ago. Um, I'd say a couple of things. One is that, uh, you know, in the US system, it's not a good idea to apply with a fully formed project, whereas in the UK system, that's precisely what's expected of you. If you don't have a fully formed project, they'll basically be wondering why you're applying for a PhD. You're supposed to figure that one out, that question out, and then come here and you're doing the implementation of that project. Despite what, you know, um, Mohammed was saying about you're not really actually going to stick to that exact project throughout, it's going to change, it's going to develop, etc. But in the US system, it's basically, you're not applying with a project per se, you can say, I'm interested in exploring this question, that question, etc. Um, and this is probably, you know, and you also don't want to identify one single supervisor there when you're applying, because in a sense, you want as many people on the admissions committee to fight for your entry. Um, you, you could say, I'd like to study with such and such, such and such, such and such a scholar within the department. And it's possible that I will sort of pursue my doctorate with advice from all, all of them. Um, and in a sense, that's a good move when it comes to applying to the US system. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are significant distinctions in terms of the application process and it really differs from institution to institution. Princeton was the only place that I'm aware, which is where I did my PhD, that actually flew people out to do interviews or I mean, even domestically, people would be flying because America is such a big country. And um, but most places, I think, just expect to see your application. So it's the strength of your it's not entirely fair to call it a proposal, but it would be something like a statement of purpose and it might be fairly detailed um, alongside your reference letters. And perhaps a very important component is your writing sample in the humanities, because it it's supposed to demonstrate whether or not you can basically you'll be submitting something like 25 pages double spaced um, and it'll uh, you know, the closer that that looks to something that is publishable, the better. So those, I think, uh, probably would be the major considerations. I hope I've answered the question. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it seems like it is very much, um, there are different parameters that are important in the UK and the different parameters are very important in the US. Um, seems like there is a board that you are trying to, to sort of penetrate into and get to be on your side in the US, whereas in the UK, it's very much, it's, can I add something? So in, in the UK, if your supervisor wants, uh, and um, they have to be a permanent post holder in the department, if they want you to be accepted into the uh, uh, university, uh, in the humanities in a place like Oxford, that's more or less guaranteed you'll be accepted into the university. Whether you get funding or not depends on the strength of your application. That's where an entire board will be con concerned. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, and it slipped my mind back, so it'll come back at some point, but okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, right, so there's some clear differences there to consider um, if you're looking at the US as opposed to the UK. So in the last panel, we talked about um, coming to the decision to make a PhD, when is the right time and so on. And um, with all of you here, we have, alhamdulillah, we have the blessing that you've all come out the other end of the PhD now. So um, you have the, the sort of, um, added advantage of sort of hindsight as well. Um, so when it comes to after a PhD, um, what are the sorts of directions you can take with this? And how did this sort of shape your, your career um, compared to how you'd envisioned it before you applied for the PhD? Um, and also um, in terms of different career options you can have in your specific field, do you feel your PhD has really added value and improved? Um, your, your career directions. Let's start with um, Mohammed, please. Um, sure. So um, I want to just jump back to the previous question because I um, I thought I'd I thought there'd be a question in between. Um, so just one thing that I wanted to highlight was uh, in terms of uh, the relative weight of um, application versus interview. Um, um, I would say for for the uh, for the sciences for the for the for the natural sciences. Um, Typically, the application would be the first filter, um, and people who would reach the the point where uh, you'll be shortlisted for interview um, can be seen as more or less equal uh, or on equal footing. And now you and now you need to demonstrate that all of these interesting projects that you've said you've done, um, all of this extra reading that you've said you've you've done, um, you've uh, a obviously done it, but but b you've actually deeply engaged with it to the point that you um, that you demonstrate this potential for independence. So. Um, a classic example, classic question that would come up in an interview would be, you know, so you did this project on X, Y, Z, uh, tell us more about this, tell us more about uh, your contribution to this. And if it's really clear from your answer that all you've done is just take some instructions, um, that's not gonna make you very competitive. So what you need to show with all of these projects, A, when you're actually doing them, but also B, when you're preparing for the interview, you need to really have read clearly about the project, understood what the project was, understood what the big question was and what your part to that question was. Um, and, and somehow, if, if possible, even link it to the project that you're applying for. Um, so that was something that I uh, just wanted to expand upon. Now, in terms of what comes after a PhD, um, I think a PhD opens up a, a number of avenues for you. So um, from a PhD, you can go on to continue in academia, of course, and, and uh, and do postdoctoral work um, with perhaps the aim of eventually becoming independent and having your own group if you're, if you're in the natural sciences. Um, and you gradually become more and more responsible um, as, as, you, uh, as you progress. So uh, it becomes more about becoming independent. And actually the sort of um, 
the the benchmark or the 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 the, the point at which people will refer to you as an independent researcher is when you have your own group. And so, really, the if you want to continue in academia, the main thing that you're focusing on throughout your postdoctoral work is to build up your research portfolio to the point uh, that you that, that you can get funded yourself for your own uh, independent work. Um, and but 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 PhD also opens up other uh, um, routes and other careers for you. Uh, you'll be very competitive for consulting jobs, for example. You'll be very competitive for various kinds of industry jobs, uh, who will typically hire uh, someone at that level. So because you've developed this independence as a PhD student, uh, that kind of skill set, problem solving skill set, and sort of proactivity is 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 very attractive for various jobs. And that skill set is certainly uh, very unique compared to anything you would have acquired at the bachelor or master level as well. So, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, Mohammed, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I'll do what Mohammed did and jump back a couple of questions as well first. Um, in terms of uh, advice for economics PhD, um, like rightly or wrongly, um, to get into um, a top uh, economics PhD program these days, you have got to have done a lot of maths in your um, in your studies right whether undergrad or your master's level um, you may not actually uh, end up using the maths that much if you do like economic history or something like this but it's used as a screening device like who can do the maths and who can't do the maths who can do stats who can't do stats right so they generally advise you to do maths until it hurts basically um, um, and, and that's used as part of like the qualifying exams in many of these PhD programs. And so, you know, ultimately the topic that you maybe end up studying may not require you to use that much like formal kind of uh, pure maths. Stats, definitely it would, um, but you have to get through that painful process of, of, of the maths, right? So you, you basically have to do the maths till it hurts. And it may be that, you know, um, and I know from personal experience, like I started my PhD relatively late, it's, it's, starts getting harder and harder to do maths proofs the older you get like that's just that's just the fact right um and so there, there probably is the right, the right age to kind of put yourself through that pain um you know when i hear Mohammed talk about like portfolio ownership and all of this stuff um that's not expected for an economics person until they go on the job market post phd that kind of like maturity of like having ideas, having like showing that you're going to be owning a, a portfolio and, and running a few things rather than just a glorified RA for your supervisor. That's something that you're going to have to demonstrate towards the end of the PhD. And as you hit the job market, that you're not basically just an RA for your, for your supervisor and that you can run a kind of independent portfolio, bring in your own grants, et cetera. Um, so you have to show that, but uh, kind of more towards the end. Um, in terms of like career options, I mean, the obvious one is it's always going to be investment banking, um, quantitative hedge funds, this kind of thing, consulting um, for, for anyone with economics, PhD, um, that's industry, right? But then there's also working for the World Bank, um, the IMF, uh, OECD, those kind of organizations, that's also a big um, point. Um, and and uh, of course, uh, academia, uh, true. And, and the thing that these days, uh, many people are doing quite data heavy kind of research as in an economics PhD, so dealing with like, uh, data analytics, econometrics, et cetera. And that can become very useful in, in a number of corporations as well. So many people end up working for Google, Facebook, analytics kind of division, running like small RCTs um, for, for these like large companies, Uber, et cetera. So there are quite a few options in that respect. It's quite a broad range of options, actually. Yeah. Um, should I briefly sort of reflect? And I am tempted to sort of uh, go a little back as well, because I remembered what I wanted to mention, which is to make a very good impression. Um, it does help, even though there are no interviews in most cases, if you go and visit uh, the scholars in question in person, um, I think that allows to sort of, because a lot of these scholars will get, you know, dozens of applications and to stand out sometimes showing that degree of uh, initiative going and they can assess in an informal way, the fact that you're familiar with the field, etc. I think that's quite important or potentially quite important. And before I went, uh, applied to the US, I actually flew out there and visited uh, four different um, universities and met with a number of scholars across those universities. And I think that did help. As a, a colleague of mine once put it, they can put a face to a name. Uh, otherwise, just a, a number or a name on an application form. And um, 
the other thing, uh, uh, and this sort of, I don't encourage doing this in a mercenary fashion, do this in a scholarly fashion, but, you know, engage the scholars um, of the department that you're applying to, like, try and look at their work, be familiar with it and be able to, I mean, to a certain extent, there's a, a certain degree of flattery involved in this almost, that if you're taking their scholarship seriously, um, that's an obvious reason for you to go and want to study with them. And this probably goes back to a previous session, um, the first hour, but I remember this is good advice um, that I was given when I was an um, sort of undergraduate thinking about PhD. Um, I was told by one of my um, teachers who's now a colleague of mine, Christopher Melchert in my department, that, um, you know, look at scholars uh, who's writing you like because um, and and you would like to study with them because they will train you to write like them. Uh, so that's very much in the humanities. The sort of analysis that you'll engage in, the sorts of uh, questions that you'll investigate, will be similar to those that have been investigated and analysed by previous scholars. To answer your question on careers, the humanities doesn't, I think, have quite as much latitude um, in terms of uh, you know as the sciences and perhaps even the social sciences. Um, you generally uh, sort of, um, you know, in a sense, that you're, if you're doing a PhD in the humanities, uh, especially in the US, you're doing this because you want to go into a career in academia. In the UK, I think, um, considering just how few jobs there are in the humanities overall, I think um, something like a majority of people who do humanities PhDs don't end up doing academic jobs. And for those sorts of people, I think there are sort of uh, many other options, which I'm not very familiar with, but um, because I've come out of the US system and most of my colleagues are basically in academic jobs. But, um, you know, going into industry, working in various kinds of, uh, I, I have a colleague um, who <clears throat> didn't really finish his PhD, but he works in <clears throat> the civil service fast stream, for example. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, similarly going to Google, I, I have colleagues who, you know, uh, went from academia to the think tank world and from the think tank world to uh, Google. Um, so I have a colleague who, who sort of is working in Google now from my department in Princeton. So those sorts of options are definitely available. I'm not the best person to ask on the details of that, but uh, you know, there are all sorts of options. One of the things I'll close with this, that I recommend uh, you know, Muslims going into Islamic studies specifically to think about the, you know, they're doing a PhD in Islamic studies as a contribution to the knowledge in that field which they may not be able to continue um, you know, on looking in academia and so on in that, on that level, but they will at least have produced that sort of monograph, that 100,000 words on this discrete subject, which will be of benefit um, in the field of Islamic studies that other people can utilize in the future. That's a really key point as well, absolutely. Um, and that's something that as you know, that the sort of Muslim researchers network that's um, very much at the ethos of why uh, we're pushing to have more Muslims in in research contributing to this knowledge and especially in the Islamic studies domain. Um, okay, so maybe uh, can I just add that I've actually like myself read many like doctoral theses of people who have done Islamic studies work and they've ended up not in academia, but I've just found them like really useful references and I know that people do right so like really reiterate really the point that Osama made that you can actually make a big contribution even if you leave academia because people do pick up your thesis like years later right um, that's, a, that's a really really important point um that the PhD itself is is a contribution within itself um, um so a little bit more about how to get onto this ladder uh, more specifically a bit more from a pragmatic point of view, how do you go about contacting a PI or, or a professor or someone you've identified? And um, we touched on this a little bit in the first panel, but how much scope is there for you to sidestep into a domain you don't necessarily have background? And I think Mohammed, you mentioned a little bit about these pre-docs um, that I'd never heard of previously, but um, how, could you, how could you go about doing that practically and making a good impression? I mean, it's in economics, it's, the root is basically as an RA, right? You just need to get an, an RA job for someone and just prove that you can do the data work. You can, you can like, you're good at cleaning data, managing data, analyzing data. Um, you're organized, you're hardworking, et cetera. I mean, I mean, generally that's how people go in these days is as an RA for someone else, um, get exposure to senior researchers and their methods um, and, and go from there really. And how is that different in the sciences, Mohammed? I think it's quite similar in the sense that you do have to uh, get 
your hand get a sort of hands-on experience typically before you apply for a PhD in something that is somewhat relevant um, doesn't need to be the exact topic um, uh, but you need to, to get some uh, uh, experience for example in data analysis which uh, in anything quantitative you need to, to start getting good at um, or in the broad field that you're trying to get into so something related to molecular biology if you're going to do uh, one of the various things that comes under that including cancer research or uh, uh, or uh, virology or, 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 or something else. Um, so uh, it's important to do that. And one way to do that is to become an RA. Um, that's, that's one way of doing it. It's not the only way. Certainly a lot of people that, um, that go into PhDs without uh, experience as an RA or, or having only done uh, sort of summer projects. Um, if, uh, as to the question of um, how can you approach a PI, uh, I think the best I mean, the best way is to, uh, in the initial email, um, not send a sort of generic, um, I would like to apply to your lab kind of email. You need to um, personalize it. You need to show evidence that you've read some of their work, you've understood it. If there's a specific aspect of it that you would like to work on, um, and then uh, that's more likely to, to get you success. Um, and then uh, take it from there and be persistent. So, um, you know, if they don't respond within a week, you know, send another email. Um, I, I, I was still the story of how I got my PhD by basically um, calling my PI insistently for weeks on end until they eventually uh, replied. Uh, and they were actually quite angry at me uh, initially, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it worked in the end. Um, so, uh, and finally, uh, sidestepping into a different field. So I've somehow done that, uh, somewhat done that. So I've, I've, I started off in biochemistry and I'm now a cognitive neuroscientist. So it's, these two are very different fields um, within biology. Um, it's been a little bit more gradual than that in the sense that I, from my undergraduate in biochemistry, I moved on to a sort of neuroscience masters first uh, and then more of a systems neuroscience PhD and eventually Sort of moved all the way as far as possible as I can be from biochemistry into cognitive neuroscience. Um, so it was a little bit gradual, but still at every step there had to be some extra reading, some extra evidence of doing uh, uh, projects that are relevant to the next step. So um, I think it's possible. Uh, it depends how far you're moving from your current field, but the further you're moving, the more you're going to have to do extra reading, and extra work basically. Can I just pick up on something Mohammed said about these generic emails? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not a good idea. I mean, we probably all receive generic emails saying, "Oh, I'm really interested," and sometimes they're not even using our name, right? It's just like, "Dear." Um, but it, it, I was just thinking when he was speaking, like, how do you like how do you approach someone in a in a kind of like substantial kind of way, right? Not just kind of um, yeah, a token kind of way. And if you like start actually read someone's work and it touches on Osama's point as well, right? Like if you read someone's paper and then you have like a specific question, maybe you have a correction for them, all right? Or a specific question or, a, you know, follow up, you know, there are often like loose ends in papers and projects and things like this. I mean, that's a really kind of like proper way to engage with someone, right? It's like, I was looking at your paper and I, I was thinking, you know, could you take it in this direction or, or what did you think about this thing? I mean, that's a really nice way of doing it, right? Um, potentially. And the persistence thing, absolutely, right? I mean, many academics are bad at replying to email and 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 just keep going, <laughs> like just keep trying them, right? Like you'll get annoyed, but at some point they'll be like, okay, this is the kind of person I want on the team, right? Because, you know, they're persistent. Excellent, great. That, that's really good advice from, from both of you. Um, so Muhammad being persistent and Muhammad trying to really personalize your understanding of that person's research and building on it as well, because you're demonstrating great skill there in doing that. Yeah. You did have to remind me the question, because <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a very interesting response to it, but yes. Yeah, the, so the question was effectively, how do you go about practically in terms of contacting a PI and, you know, pitching yourself? Into right. So, I mean, of course, uh, I'd say a couple of things. We don't work in PI terms generally in, in the humanities. Um, we do have some scholars who are working as PIs for certain large projects, and that's how it works in the UK very often. But um, generally, um, you know, it's really about sort of, and, and we don't have research assistantships and things like that um, in the humanities generally. There's not enough money slushing around, so to speak. <laughs> That's often in in the human in the social sciences uh, like economics and in in the sciences it's basically industry 
um, or very large and well-funded um, sort of research um, uh, councils and so on, which are very often in large part funded by industry that they are able to sort of um, subvene, so to speak, that sort of cost. In the humanities, uh, you know, the, the problem with the humanities is it doesn't make uh, money, right? And so that's why, um, you know, very few people go and do humanities PhDs in the grand scheme of things. It's people who are very passionate about what they're doing. And what you do is basically precisely what uh, Mohammed was mentioning earlier, you're reading very broadly. and. One of the things that Gregory cements of that book I mentioned earlier, he says early on in that text that, look, if you can't read, um, you know, he's talking about sort of a, uh, a novel. If you can't read a novel cover to cover, and I'd say, if you can't read an academic book cover to cover and enjoy it and go enjoy that process and do that repeatedly week after week after week, you probably don't want to become an academic, right? You may still want to do a PhD for three or four years of your life. You might not enjoy it as much, uh, but you might do it just as, you know, that contribution to knowledge. But you read, uh, you know, in terms of approaching scholars, um, you read their material, you really are reflective and you read broadly and are able to engage. You, you, are, you have some familiarity with what a field looks like. You're able to engage. And then through that process, you have these questions that come up that you want to engage that scholar on. And that's just a wonderful hook to get them sort of to reel them in, so to speak, because... Uh, there's nothing more gratifying for a scholar <laughs> than to have their ideas seriously grappled with by intelligent people. And so, um, you know, that's one thing I would definitely say. And um, there's another point that Mohammedi mentioned, which um, just, it, it slipped my mind again. But, um, you know, I, I do think that there are, uh, there has to be that genuine um, sort of engagement with issues. And that is what will translate into effective engagement with a scholar. Um, if you're interested in um, a certain scholar and you want to apply to a PhD in, uh, in the UK, for example, with them, you usually will contact them directly and get to know them, develop a relationship, and they will actually have a read of your proposal in advance uh, of your submitting it. They will usually ask for your uh, CVs and things like that, just so that they're familiar with you know, what you're doing. And they might say, yes, I think this is something that you can do. And I, yes, I think uh, you, know, you should go ahead and apply. And I don't know, um, I'm not a permanent uh, staff member, so I don't accept PhD students myself, but I don't know if they're allowed to signal to applicants in advance that apply for this and you will be accepted. Um, but if you want to get funding, you need to do this, this, this and this uh, to make yourself competitive. So that's how it would look in the UK. And in the US, as I've already mentioned, you're, you're pitching to a department rather than a single scholar. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got one question that's been coming up a lot. Uh, it's about sort of um, work-life balance as a PhD or in academia. Um, Mohammadi, if we start with you, could you sort of shed some light on that sort of work-life balance and um, juggling different different interests as well? Absolutely, yeah. Um, um, the first thing to say is that this is a really important question that you have to think about uh, early on. And it's not a trivial thing to say because many of us don't really give it um, its due work. But you, you, you do need to think about um, having a work-life balance, uh, both for the for, for the quality of your life, but for the quality of your work as well. Um, uh, and I think there's no easy sort of answer to it, other than to constantly be um, trying to improve it. Basically, um, I've uh, spoken before about this. Um, so, from my own personal experience, um, uh, during my PhD, I had very little work-life balance, and that was purely out of choice. Um, so, you know, I would, I felt that there was a need for me to be there a certain amount of hours, uh, come in a certain uh, um, uh, weekends on a sort of regular basis. And um, from experience, I think that wasn't an efficient way of doing the work. Um, and it certainly wasn't healthy. So um, I sort of learned from that experience and, and uh, Alhamdulillah improved uh, as a progress from, from the PhD. But my advice to people is to sort of not make the same mistakes, really uh, try and um, uh, look at look at um, some of these successful uh, scientists in PI, and you can see some of them have very strict boundaries when it comes to work and life. Um, there are surely ones that have ve seem to have very little life and, and, and work on weekends, but there are others who are equally, if not more, successful. Who I've seen people nominated for Nobel prizes who strictly finish at five pm, go home, spend the time with their with their kids, never come on, on weekends. They do exist, 
but they're very, very disciplined and they make sure that they work very hard during the time that they're there and they're very efficient. So you need to spend a lot of time thinking about how to be more efficient rather than just how to be in the lab for longer. Um, and it's something that you know you will get better at, but only with sort of proactivity. Um, it's not just going to come spontaneously. Excellent, thank you. Um, some great advice there in terms of you know juggling that and making sure your time is actually productive as well. And um, Mohammed, would you like to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I was on a panel with Mohammed recently on uh, marriage and what mar mar balancing that life as well. And it's it's a sim it's a similar thing. Like when I was um, when I was younger, um, I used to like regularly put in like 14, 15 hour days um, at work and, you know, even during the default. And, you know, when you have other responsibilities in your life and you have other, you can't be that, you can't, you know, you can't be selfish like that anymore. Like you can't just have that focus on work and nothing else. And, and it requires you to be more efficient. Like Mohammed said, like, you just have to say, listen, I'm, you know, I can dedicate a smaller proportion of my day to work, but I have to do it more efficiently i have to cut out the slack right i have to um yeah, i have to identify which areas of my lifestyle are not really essential um but yeah i've, I've struggled with this work-life balance th throughout my life which is basically just too much work um and at the moment it's kind of a bit of a struggle at the, as well with teaching and supervision and admissions and things like this and and like you have you know <laughs> Like you think, okay, maybe I should just sleep less, right? Maybe I should just sleep less to stay on top of all this work to stop myself drowning. But you just go crazy, right? So at some point, it's like Hamid said, you have to be like efficient. You have to just realize that I have to close the, the inbox at some point. Like am I, I might be flooding with emails, right? But I just have to shut the inbox and switch up because otherwise I'm just going to go mad, you know? So and everyone's got advice for good coping mechanisms and you should speak as many people as possible which coping me mechanisms they use because they're different for different people right and uh osama mashallah you've also got a family as well so anything you'd like to add sure yeah. sure i mean uh, uh, what i'd say is this is not actually necessarily just a problem of academia although this is something that definitely exists in academia but it's a problem of the way in which you know the global economy is set up uh, and the way in which capitalist capitalism operates right now um, and the levels of inequality it creates and the fact that, you know, at the bottom, that is basically the 99%, um, you know, we really are uh, in a kind of rat race and it's, you can never make it to the top. You can never make it to the place where you can finally rest. And the system is, I think, designed to create those conditions. So there are more systemic questions to address in a sense in, in which academia with the, you know, what some scholars refer to as the corporatization of the university, um, reflects a lot of those sorts of you know uh, things, unfortunately. Uh, but at the same time, um, there are ways to ameliorate those sorts of pressures, and we will have you know differing levels of success. Um, I think, uh, particularly early on in our careers, um, and I've you know I'm I'm in my uh, mid to late thirties, and I've got two children, uh, both under the age of well two and under, and uh, I'm in lockdown with them for the last year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult to get work done. And so, you know, I, Alhamdulillah, I have, in a sense, a bit of a luxury that, um, you know, I have a DL, which a departmental lectureship, which uh, is rolling over, inshallah. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's a very different scenario to most people on the academic job market this year, uh, facing an absolutely decimated um, sort of uh, uh, array of jobs. And so, um, I, I think in those sorts of circumstances, I actually have benefited a lot from, you know, using self-help literature <laughs> personally. Like there's a great book, which I used as, an, uh, as a PhD student called Writing Your Dissertation 15 Minutes a Day. Um, and uh, it's for the humanities, but by someone called Joan Bolker. But it also gives a lot of advice on how to just men uh, balance the mental health uh, concerns because uh, in academia and particularly in, in PhDs, um, there's a huge amount of uh, mental health um, or mental health dysfunction, shall we say, just in the way that things are structured, unfortunately. And it's also the fact that in the humanities in particular, you're usually working in an isolated fashion. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed that I actually finished my PhD while I was married. 
um, I don't know if my wife would see that as a blessing, right? But in the sense that, you know, I had human interaction on a regular basis. The fact that I had a child, um, you know, at the point I was defending my dissertation was also something which, um, you know, just gave me a sense of reality, right? This obsession that I have with finishing these, these 80,000 to 100,000 words uh, need to be put in perspective as well, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually mentioned that in the acknowledgements of my dissertation, I was like, you know, my wife um, having a child in my final year of my dissertation writing just gave me a sense of perspective. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's those sorts of things. And I, I'm someone who is quite a happy advocate of self-help literature and these sorts of things, whether it's academic, whether it's sort of more general mental health, um, mental self-help. So yeah, I, I would I would suggest all of this. Although I'll just caveat that that the entire industry of self help is a you know is a facet of the dysfunction of the systems that we work with, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a useful caveat actually. <laughs> but Jazakallah khair, that mashallah, that's, that's lovely advice. Um, we've got lots of different questions here. I'm trying to group them slightly in the interest of time. Um, so. Um, one question here, which I think has come in a couple of times now is, um, how do you choose between a subject that you are very, very passionate in uh, versus a subject that is probably more favorable in terms of career prospects and is more likely to get a uh, new job? So if we go back to our, uh, Mohammed, maybe? Yeah, I, I just want to jump in with that. Um, something I feel quite strongly about. I, I don't know if the panelists will agree with me, but I'll, I'll, I'll just give my two cents on that. I think. The way that I, I think of this question is that you need to, the first filter that you need to apply is, am I interested in this? This, this has to be the first filter. Again, it's not, it's not, I don't think of it as a way, weighing, weighing between the two. I think one is much, has much more weight and that is, am I interested in this? The reason being is that academic work is driven by the, the academic. It's driven by your own um, sort of interest and, and pursuit of this knowledge. And so this is a question that you're not interested in. Um, then that creates problems both in terms of the quality of your work, but also in terms of your own sort of mental well-being and, and, and happiness and, and, and drive and motivation. If it's not something that you're passionate about, then, then, then that's already something that, that needs to not, not feature in your, in your, um, in your applications at all. Um, once you've identified a bunch of things that you're interested in, a group of things that you're interested in uh, above a certain threshold, then then you can choose based on other criteria. Mm -hmm. For example, is it is this a hot topic? Is this something that's highly funded? Um, is it uh, going to provide me with a good work-life balance? Um, so um, I would say the criteria of you you being passionate about something should come first, um, and all other considerations should come after oh. that. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much. I would, um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, the, 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 the am I interested thing for me would be like a necessary but insufficient condition, right? So like, if you're not interested in the topic, just like, for me, that, that's, that's a non-starter, right? But then as I said, there's a bunch of things that you're interested in. And so that's like a necessary condition, but it's insufficient, right? Because then you have these other considerations um, in place, right? And there's this um, theory in economics, it's a theory of like trade, actually. It's the theory of comparative advantage. It's the theory that, you know, you could probably do a lot of things very well. Like I'm sure, you know, you're all very smart. You could probably do many things well, right? But which thing can you like comparatively do better in? That's one thing to consider as well, right? And I'd be keen to hear uh, Osama's opinion on this because I, if I recall correctly, either reading his biography or him discussing his biography with me, he was previously like considering medicine or something and then he decided in Islamic studies. So I think this idea of like comparative advantage is quite important as well. How you add value and what value is, 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 is subjective, right? But uh... yeah, it's very subjective. Just like Mohammed, Mohammed, I mean, both Mohammed and Mohammed um, really, uh, you know, I, I just want to, before I get to your point, Mohammed, um, just want to say this question, I don't think arises quite as much in the humanities because, you know, if you're not in, interested in the subject, you wouldn't be pursuing a PhD. Although um, some people might have sort of a very low bar for what counts as interest. So they're like big, I, I'm a Muslim and I'm interested in Islamic studies because I'm a Muslim, but they don't have necessarily a substantive scholarly interest. So I, I just qualify that as if you have a specific scholarly interest in Islamic studies that, or in the humanities more generally that compels you to constantly be reading in the area, then that is as 
Mohammed mentioned a necessary but insufficient condition. You also have to have uh, other skills, etc. I mean, in, in my particular subject, Islamic studies, perhaps one of the most important things is your ability to uh, use primary source languages. So Arabic, most importantly, but also other languages. If you're coming from the Indian subcontinent, Urdu might be very valuable as well. Uh, Turkish, uh, Persian, all of these sorts of languages are, are useful. Um, just on, you know, uh, uh, the point Mohammed mentioned, um, you know, and I've discussed with friends in the past that, um, you know, I, I actually am Asian, like any good Asian, I study physics, chemistry, biology, and maths at A level, and uh, I uh, took deferred entry into medicine at Imperial College. Um, and uh, in a sense, I never sort of really felt bad about that until the pandemic hit, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> so sometimes what is, uh, I think uh, Aristotle uh, or Plato say that eudaimonia or the notion of happiness is sometimes contingent on factors that are completely beyond one's control and they change over time. So, you know, I was perfectly happy with my choices until the pandemic hit and then I was thinking, is this really the most valuable thing that I'm doing right now? But, you know, that's a momentary, everyone has these momentary existential questions that come up. Um, I personally after i studied arabic for a year on my deferred you know uh, year out uh, as i was supposed to go into um, study medicine i basically came across something which uh, you know i i couldn't really do anything else with my life after that i came across arabic and islamic studies and I, and i thought that uh, not just that i'm very interested in this but i also thought that you know there's a far greater need for people with expertise in these sorts of areas than um, within our within the Asian community medicine because like uh, everyone and their brothers doing medicine right and um, uh, I'm not to not to disparage medicine because it's such a crucial field obviously um, but I, I I think that in terms of the comparative advantage there is uh, some benefit to coming into Islamic studies but on the other hand and I'm going to mention another book for people who are thinking about sort of the humanities PhD very seriously you know there are very few jobs out there like uh, I have a, a student who was saying that um, one of my colleagues was telling them, uh, you know, don't don't do a PhD because there are no jobs out there. And she she's a relatively high flying sort of like professor, the the colleague who was uh, recommending this to a, <laughs> one of my students. Uh, and I, I basically said, well, you're doing this as kind of because you're Muslim and you're interested in these questions. I would say this is kind of like a sadaqah that you're giving to the Muslims, to the Muslim uh, Ummah, in a sense, through your engagement with these ideas, and then you can move on to other fields. But uh, the, the, the book I was going to mention is by someone called Hume, I forget her first name, um, Surviving the Academic Job Hunt, and it's very much, you know, uh, geared towards humanities in the US, humanities PhDs in the US, but it, it's ruthless out there when it comes to looking for jobs afterwards. So those, those are also things to bear in mind when it comes to the question of, you know, am I interested in just on the question of interest, if you can't, you know, um, demonstrate your interest in reading and reading and reading in these fields, then you're not going to last those four years that you're looking forward to doing a PhD for. Um, but afterwards, um, you know, the possibility of getting a job when you're not something that you're not interested in it, and maybe you've not developed a, a significant interest will be even, you know, lower than people who are genuinely driven and interested in those fields. Sorry for the long winded answer. That's brilliant. Jazakallah. Thank you very much. Uh, we're receiving a lot of uh, slightly more specific questions. Some of you are mentioning what it is you specifically want to apply for and uh, recommendations for, for specific things to your personal case. Um, that brings us on very nicely to um, something that Mohamdi will, will discuss in a second, but um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for your time and for your invaluable insight really um, on these, these topics that we don't often get the opportunity to discuss as much. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for being candid and honest. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So I'm going to hand over to Mohammadi now, who is the one of the co-leads on the Muslim Researchers Network, and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, about that and some of the services that it offers, which will be highly valuable to all of you tuning in right now. Um, and then after that, we'll have a short break before we move on to um, our third and last session, which will be on um a workshop on how to write a sort of phd proposal and whatever so please do stay tuned for that if that is of interest to you so um Hamidi, over to you thanks very much hannah and um yeah thank you very much for all the, the panelists so far um it's, it's been brilliant to share this platform with you i just wanted to talk very briefly about 
the Muslim Researchers Network who have co-organized this, this event uh, today. So I'm gonna just share my screen with, um, with our newly made website. Hannah, can you see the website? Yes, we can see it. Great, so, um, so uh, just very briefly, we um, are aiming to be a platform that um, promotes progress and, uh, and, and excellence in academic research uh, amongst Muslims. And uh, we organize events like this one uh, and like the uh, annual research conference that, um, that's been happening over the past uh, three years. But also we've started um, to uh, really utilize this website um, for a, a number of schemes. Now, one of these is the mentorship scheme. Now, today we heard from some academics from various fields about um, quite general advice about how to apply to PhDs um, and how to find uh, 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 the right uh, supervisor and so on. Um, but if you'd like more tailored um, advice, we have the mentorship scheme, which uh, we've recently started. Um, so if you go to uh, muslimresearchersnetwork.org and then uh, navigate to the mentorship, um, you'll start to see that we've started to build up a, 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 a portfolio of a number of, um, uh, of mentors, which uh, is currently growing. So um, what you can do here is you can um, sort of uh, find out uh, about whether there's a, a mentor that is of interest to you. Well, currently we only have uh, uh, four, but there's, this is going to uh, uh, grow over the next few weeks, inshallah. And then what you can do is um, scroll down and, and sort of sign up uh, to be mentored um, by someone on this on this uh, on this scheme. Um, and so you enter your details. You you tell us um, which mentor or mentors you're interested in, in being mentored by, and then uh, we can then put you in touch. Uh, with this uh, with this academic. So uh, this is especially useful if you've got uh, an application coming up. And so please tell us in, in this section here about any upcoming applications and give us as much uh, detail as, as is relevant. Um, so this is sort of the most uh, relevant aspect of the website to today's event, but there are um, other aspects of the website that are also um, uh, useful and, and interactive. So uh, for example, you can contribute to, to the website by um, publishing an article. Um, and this is really aimed at articles that are going to be um, widely accessible to, 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 to a lay audience. So we're not looking for um, you know, specific field related publications. We're looking for an article where you describe your research um, in, a, a, in a way that everyone can read and everyone can sort of appreciate. And so we've got a couple of uh, articles uh, up already. From our from our members, um, uh, so so this is uh, you know this is an opportunity for you to to show to showcase your work. Um, and other than that, there are um, uh, other parts of the website that um, you might be interested in. For example, you can find out about um, our meetings and and, and see um, uh, um, media from previous uh, conferences. And you can also uh, contact us and follow us on various. Um, uh, social media platforms um, by coming over here and, uh, and and one of the ways that we would like you to sort of uh, help us improve this is to uh, basically give us any suggestions whether it's about the mentorship scheme or about any other aspect of uh, our work uh, and so you can you can do that via the contact us page so yeah in a nutshell this is uh, this is the website this is what we do um, uh, Please do stick around us still one more hour of uh, uh, of our third section coming up. Um, and yeah, I'll hand back over to, to Hannah. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Muhammadi, for, for that uh, introduction to the MRN. I do encourage everybody here to, to take a look at the website, do sign up to the mailing list, and do keep an eye on all the different range of services that Muhammadi just talked us through. Uh, right, so uh, we'll take a break now, a slightly longer break, um, about 15 minutes. If you go and stretch your legs, get a drink, um, write some notes and all the wonderful things you've just heard, and we'll resume at 20 past three. Uh, and this is for those of you who are interested in the dedicated workshops that we'll be having on how to write um, an application proposal for a PhD. So, and see you at 20 past.